Good morning from Colombo, Sri Lanka. Um, this is Dr. Megha Ganewatta representing the Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka. I'd like to welcome all of you around the globe for the special Ahinawa G2MC Grand Rounds. Rapid advances in genome sequencing technologies, bioinformatics and computational biology is heralding in an era of genomic medicine. This series of lectures conducted by the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative supported by the Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka and the Asia Eye Health Information Network will showcase some of the pioneering initiatives in genomic medicine from around the globe. This series would be co-hosted by Professor Bruce Koch from the University of Alabama in Birmingham, United States and Professor Vajira Disanayakar from the University of Colombo, the co-chairs of the Education Working Group of G2MC. Um, before moving on to today's session, I'll briefly mention a few things to remember while using the GoToWebinar platform. Once you have logged into the platform, the webinar window is where you shall see the contents presented by the panelists, including PowerPoint, presentations, videos, etc. When the webinar starts, you will be given access to the control panel. The main control panel will auto-hide after a few seconds, leaving the small left-hand panel display. Use the hide and show control to redisplay the main control panel. You can use the raise hand button to signal that you have a question or require assistance. If you have a question, please type it in, in the uh, question panel and click send. Questions may be held until the question and answer sessions towards the end of the presentation. Please note that your microphone will be automatically muted once you join as an attendee. With this brief introduction on GoToWebinar platform, I'd like to invite Professor Bruce Koch, the co-chair of Education Working Group of the G2MC to moderate today's, today's session. Over to you, Professor Bruce. Thank you very much, and um, well, good evening, everybody from the USA. It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's, or for you tomorrow morning, speaker, uh, Dr. Terry Minolio. Dr. Minolio is the director of the Division of Genomic Medicine at the National Human Genome Research Institute of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Minolio has been a great champion of genomic medicine and of the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative, and tonight. Uh, she'll speak on genomic medicine programs at the National Human Genome Research Institute. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Minolio. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Korf. Um, can you see my, my screen and slides? Yes, Dr. Teddy. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead then. Um, I was asked to, uh, to describe some of the things that we're doing at the National Human Genome Research Institute, or, or uh, NHGRI. I should mention that we are one of uh, 27 institutes and centers of the National Institutes of Health, and we're actually one of the, of the smaller ones, but we like to think we, um, we punch above our weight, as we, as we say, and, and we get a lot done. Um, so I thought what I would do is, is describe just very, very briefly what we see as being the current state of genomic medicine, uh, consider what might be needed to make genomic medicine part of routine clinical practice. Uh, and then describe how we developed a plan to, to try to get there um, in, in terms of expanding into genomic medicine, and then describe uh, some of our programs and some uh, findings that I think you'll find interesting from them, um, and then how this links in with the, with the G2MC that uh, is hosting this program. Um, so first, just to, uh, just to kind of remind everyone of what we're considering to be genomic medicine, which is primarily using an individual's genomic information in their clinical care. Uh, we consider one of the first examples of, of this to have been um, uh, in the cancer field uh, using a, a selective inhibitor of the ABL tyrosine kinase uh, on the growth of uh, BCR-able cells in um, uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, this of course was imatinib, um, and uh, uh, very effective within five years uh, uh, clinical trials showing the efficacy of this in this uh, otherwise um, um, quite uh, serious and, and progressive uh, condition. Uh, we also see, in, in addition to cancer genomics, we see pharmacogenomics as being an area that uh, genomic medicine uh, can be applied, and we are working to do that in our programs. Uh, this is one of the first examples of um, uh, the importance of pharmacogenomics in uh, the, uh, the uh, enzyme thiopurine methyltransferase. Uh, in the genetic variant of that, uh, uh, that produces that particular protein, um, there are uh, a small, very small proportion of people that have no activity of that enzyme at all, and if they receive a normal dose of, 
of um, uh, 6-mercaptopurine or other mercaptopurines for treatment of, of leukemia, uh, they can have uh, serious and even fatal um, uh, myelosuppression. Uh, and that's shown in this uh, graph here in terms of activity. Uh, the, the one uh, uh, homozygote uh, for this variant is shown here. I don't know if my, uh, there it is. Um, it's shown here with that zero activity, and then there's a cluster of people uh, who have reduced activity, and then the, the vast range of, of normal people. Uh, again, one of the first examples of using uh, genomic information in clinical care. This is now widely used, although it took uh, close to 30 years to get it uh, accepted into clinical practice. And there are now a set of guidelines that you may have, have heard of from the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium in terms of how to use this information. Um, and then more recently, using uh, genome sequencing uh, first for optimizing patient management in, in this uh, particular case, rather sad case, of, of uh, two um, uh, fraternal twins who had a movement disorder that was initially misdiagnosed as cerebral palsy. Uh, you can see a picture of them here when they were about age four. Uh, their mother um, didn't believe that uh, their condition uh, fit with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy and actually worked very hard to try to find uh, uh, other children like uh, her own who had uh, their, their particular symptom, did manage to find them and, in fact, uh, uh, had them diagnosed. Um, she sort of self-diagnosed them and then brought them to a specialist and had them diagnosed as a, uh, a particular uh, hereditary form of um, um, uh, dopamine responsive dystonia. Um, and uh, got them under treatment, actually uh, improved quite a bit, but they didn't improve uh, as much as they would uh, would have been expected to if they had a sort of a typical form of this um, condition. And so she actually uh, pushed to have them sequenced to find out if there might be some other uh, variant that was causing their condition. And, uh, and as it turned out, there was, and that was published by this Bainbridge and, and Gibbs group um, here uh, in, uh, uh, from Baylor College of Medicine. Um, they needed, they actually had a blockage a little bit further down in the dopamine pathway and needed an additional cofactor. And once that was provided, they, their symptoms were completely relieved. Um, and they, they actually are normal, healthy teenagers, I believe, they're in, in college at, at present. And so, so stories like this, you know, that, that really in, in some ways are, are miraculous, um, are, are really inspiring many people to uh, uh, pursue the use of, of uh, individual genetic information in, uh, in terms of uh, diagnosis and treatment, and that's something that we're trying to promote uh, by our programs. So um, we tried to then sort of figure out, well, what is the best way to go about doing this? Uh, each of the NIH institutes develops what we refer to as a strategic plan, usually for a five to eight year period or so. Um, that describes where we see important scientific directions going and, and you know, how we can, can uh, approach them. Uh, ours was uh, um, focusing on uh, a variety of, of different disease-related genomics research. We recognized that it was important to do discovery research um, in looking at genotype-phenotype associations. And when we first uh, put together this the most recent plan. Uh, this was the area that was, it was about 2011, and this was an area that was receiving a lot of attention. But we also recognized we needed to do clinical validation, so really uh, assessing outcomes after using genet genetics to direct therapy, uh, looking at the impact on health outcomes, on utilization of care, uh, identifying causes of, of rare or undiagnosed diseases, as I described, um, and in looking at drug targets and developing uh, in improved therapeutic agents. And then actually in clinical implementation, developing processes for performing this testing and using the results in an individual patient's care. So uh, things like uh, developing clinical informatics systems, educating clinicians and patients, uh, defining and disseminating best practices and, and uh, information on actionable clinical variants uh, to, to be used in care. And, and so it's these, sort of these you know, two areas that really were the kind of the crux of what we felt needed to be um, uh, demonstrated in, in research programs and then carried over into the clinic. Uh, so we refer to that as, as genomic medicine, and we uh, recruited a group of folks to help us um, in, in uh, advice on sort of where this, the directions that the field is going in. And they're listed here. They're part of our uh, advisory council. Um, and there are eight of them and then three of us from, uh, from NHGRI. Uh, and one of the first things we did was to, to come up with what we felt was a working definition of genomic medicine. It's a fairly narrow one because we are a small institute and, and we do recognize that there are a lot of other things that form the foundation 
um, uh, on which uh, uh, true clinical implementation is built, but we kind of narrowed it down to, to being an emerging medical dis discipline using um, individual genomic information about a patient as part of their clinical care, and then what happens when that, when that happens, the, the health outcomes and policy implications of, of that clinical use. So, so that's how we've uh, uh, sort of pursued this area. Um, we've uh, conducted a series of meetings. Uh, we began with one in, in um, uh, June of 2011, shortly after this uh, um, plan was, was published, where we really were trying to sort of define the landscape of what was going on. We limited ourselves to the, to the United States at that point um, and just invited as many groups as we were aware of. Dr. Korf's group uh, came, there were, we were about 20 others uh, in the room, and asked them to kind of de describe what they were doing, what kinds of uh, barriers they were uh, uh, running into, what kinds of infrastructural research they, uh, research needs they had, uh, and maybe even uh, develop some kind of an outline of, of how one goes about doing this to be able to share that experience and, and expand uh, adoption of it. We published a, uh, a paper uh, from that, uh, rising from that in Genetics and Medicine, um, talking about the, the approaches to, to uh, doing this implementation. One of the things that really surprised us was there was a lot more going on uh, than, than I think we had appreciated uh, initially, although we, we had advisors who were telling us that there was a lot going on. Um, but one of the reasons people weren't aware of it is that sort of many of these centers were doing their work in sort of in isolation, and really not uh, as aware of what was going on uh, around them. Uh, and many were coming, running into the same barriers, and we thought, well, you know, what we really should try to do is to build a community of, of people working in this area so that we can learn from each other. Uh, we identified a series of challenges, and again, those are, are listed in, in that uh, um, publication. I won't go through all of them here, but I, I would imagine um, that this webinar will be available, and, and you can have the, uh, you know, the slides and any time uh, access to them. So, so a number of, of challenges uh, identified as shown there. And, and as I said, we held that first meeting in June of 2011, but then recognized that this was a very useful thing to, to try to do uh, periodically. So we held another one in, in uh, December of 2011, uh, looking at how we could uh, form collaborations. Uh, a third one about six months after that, uh, looking at other stakeholders, groups like um, policymakers, uh, payers, and, and laboratories, and, and those kinds of groups to, to try to uh, get them involved in, in this approach. Um, we had one meeting focused on physician education, and a, a large effort grew out of that. Another on um, working with some of our uh, federal agencies, like our Food and Drug Administration and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, we had a sixth meeting from which the uh, this, this Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative uh, grew, and uh, that, that focused on global leaders, and, and really again invited as many people as we knew, and, and I'm sure there were many good groups that we weren't aware of and, and we weren't uh, uh, able to include, but we hope to include in the, in the future. Um, and so that was about almost now three years ago. Uh, a, a seventh meeting on clinical decision support, uh, an eighth one that was kind of an overview of all of our programs, um, and actually the, the materials from that um, uh, meeting are, are available on our website, as are materials from all of these meetings. Uh, and if you want to, to dig down deeper into any of the programs I've described, they would be described there. Um, and a, a ninth meeting, uh, trying to take the uh, things that we've learned in the clinic uh, back to the laboratory to understand uh, mechanisms and, and perhaps develop new therapies. And actually, we'll be having a tenth meeting uh, in May in pharmacogenomics, uh, research directions on pharmacogenomic implementation. Um, if you are interested in, in looking at any of these, you can Google NHGRI genomic medicine. Uh, there's a, a website that has all of the meetings listed, and all of them but the first were actually video cast and archived so that you can get uh, copies of, or you can watch them if you, if you care to, uh, as well as all of the slides and, and meeting summaries. So those are, those are all available uh, if, you're, if you're interested. Uh, I'm going to skip past this, um, uh, which was a, a very interesting meeting and, and stimulating for all of us, but, uh, but really kind of focusing then on our genomic medicine program. Uh, this is a, a sort of a thumbnail view of the major programs that we have in genomic medicine. Um, we're focusing on, on the programs that are sort of collaborations or consortia uh, because that's where we put most of our, our focus and most of our dollars, uh, feeling that because this is a new field, we need to have a critical mass of expertise and, and you know, really frankly effort uh, to, to be able to outline and, and identify the, the um, 
things needed to, to uh, bring genomics into clinical care. Um, I, I start by listing the uh, Undiagnosed Diseases Network, the UDN, um, which was built on a program that actually began at the NIH. There are several other such programs uh, throughout the U.S. and indeed throughout the world, but uh, this was fairly early on. Um, we recognized that uh, there were uh, patients who defied diagnosis, who went from hospital to hospital and, and physician to physician, sometimes for decades, uh, un unable to get uh, to uh, determine a diagnosis, uh, and and yet uh, if one uh, used genomic techniques and, and other sophisticated laboratory techniques, often you could come up with a, a diagnosis for them. Uh, so that's a, one of the largest of our programs, and it's uh, been funded in fiscal years 13 to uh, fiscal 2013 to 2017. Our fiscal year begins in October, uh, just as some of you're aware. So we're currently in fiscal 17, even though we're in calendar uh, year uh, 16. The Ensight program is a newborn sequencing program looking at the uses of genome sequence information in the newborn period, and I'll talk about each of these a, a little bit more. Um, we do that program in collaboration with the Child Health uh, uh, Institute, this would make sense. The Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Program, or CSER, is looking at methods and issues for integrating specifically genomic sequencing information uh, into clinical care. Uh, again, a, a, another relatively large program that we co-fund with the National Cancer Institute. Um, Emerge is, is one of the oldest of our programs, and because it's been going on for so long, it, it has uh, one of the largest budgets, uh, and began as an effort to use biorepositories that at the time were sort of springing up in multiple hospitals that were saving samples from their clinical care, linking them to electronic records, and wanting to use that for, uh, use that information for genomic research. And we, we worked with uh, several of these kinds of programs to determine what would be the best approaches for doing this in terms of uh, consent and community consultation, working with patients and clinicians, uh, and, and then actually using uh, this information. Currently, uh, Emerge is in its, in its third iteration, so each of our programs uh, undergoes a renewal, usually within about four years, sometimes five, uh, where we take a hard look at, at what's been done in the program and achieved. Uh, and then ask ourselves, is this something that we should continue? Um, is, it, is it something that we should modify and go in, in slightly different directions, or, or should we scrap it entirely and, and do something else? Um, so Emerge has, has been through that process now um, uh, twice, and so it's in its third iteration, uh, and uh, is looking currently at uh, uh, the penetrance of, of over 100 clinically relevant genes uh, in 25,000 individuals, and, and really asking the question, if we find loss of function variants in, in these particularly uh, clinically actionable genes, such as genes recommended for reporting uh, back uh, by the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, um, you know, how, how often do we actually see um, clinical manifestations of those loss of function variants? Because it doesn't seem as though um, they, they are quite as, as frequent, at least they don't cause disease as frequently as they seem to appear in the genome. And so, so we're trying to correlate that. Our IGNITE program is uh, uh, really trying to take proven genomic medicine uh, uh, efforts, such as um, uh, looking at the APOL1 variant in relationship to African American um, uh, hypertensive kidney disease. It's a very strong risk factor for uh, kidney damage and kidney failure. Uh, in, in hypertension, particularly in people of, of African ancestry, um, primarily because it doesn't seem to occur in, in uh, uh, people of other reported ancestries. Uh, but that's one that, you know, you start that at a, at a, a very uh, sophisticated place uh, at Mount Sinai in this particular instance, and then trying to take that out into the community, into either community hospitals or family practice settings or, or individual uh, uh, clinical practices. And similarly, efforts in, uh, in taking uh, family history information, a, a, a nice family history tool, uh, of which there are now about uh, 12 to 15 or so automated family history tools. This particular one uh, originated at Duke University, and then uh, uh, trying to expand that out to a, a variety of centers across the country, and really asking the question, you know, when, when we take genomic medicine into a routine setting that is, is not um, specifically dedicated to doing that kind of work, what kinds of adjustments need to be made, and, and how can one do that in a, in a cost-effective and, and uh, you know, efficient manner. Uh, and then finally, our ClinGen program um, is to, to try to ask the question, well, what are the things that are proven that are, are, are known to be actionable and, and should be acted upon? 
um, and um, I recommend those to a variety of experts who then decide what the actions should be and whether they agree with, uh, with what's been decided. But um, uh, that's a, a sort of a consensus process for trying to determine uh, that. And so I'll describe each of these in, in a little bit more detail and some interesting findings uh, from them. But that's, the, that's kind of the overall program. Um, and kind of looking at it in a, um, a more schematic view, if you, if you kind of think of these plotted along two directions with increasing depth of patient characterization uh, going down the y-axis here and increasing breadth of implementation across the x-axis, uh, and you kind of you know, shoot an arrow across there, the, the UDN, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, really very, very tightly focused on the patient. Um, patients are, are admitted for a week of uh, intensive investigation. Uh, and uh, uh, the implementation breadth is, is much narrower than some of the other programs. Uh, <clears throat> the newborn program is, is quite similar, uh, very much focused on, on patient characterization and, and much less so on, on uh, broad implementation. So we have those programs kind of in the lower left-hand corner with an individual patient focus, uh, but looking at multiple models, multiple different approaches of, of trying to uh, uh, use genomics in clinical care. Um, our clinical sequencing exploratory research program, or CSER, uh, is a little more um, uh, involved in implementation as well as, as focusing on individual patients and clinicians, and actually is, is looking at the, the impact of sequencing on not only clinicians but laboratories, so trying to get laboratories to interpret variants in similar ways uh, and use that information in a, in a more standardized approach. Um, that, uh, that then is transferable from one hospital to our system to another. Uh, the eMERGE program, as I mentioned, using electronic medical records and genomics uh, together um, and, and uh, trying to determine how that influences care, and then the IGNITE program in um, uh, disseminating these kinds of approaches from sophisticated to, to more routine uh, clinical settings. And those are uh, more focused on evidence generation and sort of system-wide impacts. That's one way of kind of looking at the whole um, program. We consider the ClinGen resource the one that is developing consensus information on using these variants it, to kind of be an, an overarching program for all of these because it really underpins um, uh, all, of, all of what we're doing. So just to, to uh, focus in a, a bit, the newborn sequencing uh, program, the NSITE program has four grantees. Uh, they're shown here, Harvard Medical School, uh, looking at both uh, infants, very sick infants in the neonatal intensive care unit or NICU, uh, healthy newborns as well, uh, trying to determine what newborn uh, sequencing adds to uh, other screening programs that are ongoing in, in newborns. Uh, Stephen Kingsmore at Children's Mercy Hospital uh, focusing solely on, on critically ill infants in the neonatal intensive care unit uh, with 1,000 uh, children, again, uh, assessing what the sequencing adds. Uh, the University of California, San Francisco, actually is, is looking at uh, newborn blood spots that are gathered from every uh, infant born in California and indeed in the United States uh, currently, um, and uh, uh, trying to determine from those blood spots can, can we see how sequencing would add value to that program. Um, and then the University of North Carolina uh, looking at uh, unselect, sort of unselected infants that are, that are consented in pregnancy and again asking the question of what is added by that information. Uh, one of the, the striking findings from that program early on has been the very high yield of uh, genome sequencing in critically ill infants. It's pretty clear now that um, patients admitted to our level three and level four neonatal intensive care units, which are, are again, the very, the very sickest uh, newborn infants, uh, typically not those that, are, that simply have prematurity, although those are also uh, very sick children. Um, but uh, were those that have sepsis, you know, if it's a, a clear infection, probably not um, so much genetically determined in most cases, although there are obviously genetic causes for susceptibility to infection. Um, but what the Kingsmore group did in Kansas City was to take uh, just a small sample, 35 in infants under four months of age, um, in the, the uh, pediatric intensive care unit or the neonatal intensive care unit. They were able to do sequencing of, of targeted uh, genes, the genes that they uh, knew would be likely to cause uh, serious illness uh, early, very early, early in life, um, and turn those around within 26 hours. So this is very, very rapid sequencing. Uh, they recognize that when you have um, newborns this ill, you can't wait four to six weeks for results to come back, and so they've developed a pipeline to be able to do this. 
uh, and we're able to make diagnoses in 57% of, uh, of those infants um, versus only 9% with sort of standard approaches to, to uh, diagnosis and genetics uh, previously. And two-thirds of those diagnoses had an immediate impact on clinical management. So of those diagnosed, there was a, a significant uh, change in clinical care. So all of these were, were really, you know, fairly dramatic. Now this was a small sample. Um, uh, Dr. Kingsmore has since moved to uh, San Diego and basically replicated these findings in uh, the, the uh, NICU in San Diego with a, a very similar diagnostic yield, 54%, I, I believe it was. Um, and he is now working to try to, to expand this effort to actually um, all of the level four um, intensive care units in uh, California. There are 44 of them or something like that. So, so quite an effort, uh, but one that, uh, that really has a, a very high yield. Um, the CSER program, uh, again, as I mentioned, looking at challenges in applying sequence data to clinical care, um, including uh, clinical workflow, interpreting and translating data for clinicians and communicating findings to patients, also developing best practices for whole genome sequence and whole exome sequence in a clinical uh, setting, not a research setting, and then uh, develop the evidence base for, for that implementation. These are the nine projects that are currently funded, and this program is also a full renewal. It's, it's been out for um, about four and a half years now, so it's about to be renewed. Uh, and uh, you can see there are a number of uh, pediatric conditions, children with intellectual dysfunction, uh, also a number of cancer programs. Uh, the CRC is colorectal cancer down there at the bottom, but also cardiomyopathy, healthy patients, et cetera. Um, one of the, the interesting uh, things to come out of, of this effort in CSER was um, rather similar to the twins I told you about previously. Uh, a mutation found um, as a treatable condition in a patient who thought, who's thought to have a progressive spastic paraplegia. Uh, this was a, a young woman who uh, had presented, I think at the age of six, was also misdiagnosed initially as having cerebral palsy. She um, got worse, which does not typically happen with cere cerebral palsy, and then was diagnosed as having a spastic paraplegia. Uh, and they had looked for the known genetic causes of that spastic paraplegia, and so she was seen in the CSER program, and actually uh, sequencing of other um, genes was, was done, and, and this particular variant was identified, which hadn't previously been shown to be a cause of, of a spastic uh, dystonia. She was uh, given a, a dopamine uh, precursor and was able to walk without crutches. You see her here on the, on the right. Uh, for the for the first time in, in you know over ten years, so so truly again, you know, some of these are are really almost almost miraculous um, uh, events, and our our hope is that uh, we'll be able to find more and more of these and and actually um, institute relatively innocuous therapies that that can then make a, a huge difference in these patients' lives. Uh, another thing that has, has come from um, the CSER program is that the recognition that um, classification of variants changes over time as information accrues. And so uh, using classifying uh, variants in, in terms of disease, uh, disease causing, that either they are benign or you know, definitely benign, there's absolutely uh, no likelihood that they are causing disease, or they look benign but we're not quite so sure about it, um, or it's really not clear whether they, they could Uh, causing um, uh, work through by, again, the leadership of the American College of, of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and, and really a, a, you know incredible effort on, on their part. What was, what was interesting um, from the, the CSER experience, particularly in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is HCM, uh, in the group at um, Harvard Partners in Boston, uh, was that they, they found that over time there were a fair number of variants, 56 of them shown here, I think of a couple of thousand, uh, that shifted from initially being of unknown significance to, to actually being likely pathogenic. Um, and it's, it would be important then to be sure that that information gets back to that, the doctor and patient uh, to you know, allow them to make decisions that might be appropriate with that added information. Uh, and actually there are others, and you know, sort of referred to as high alerts, um, that shifted from you know, variants that were thought to be pathogenic that shifted down to really we're not sure, we don't think they are pathogenic, we're not sure what they do. 
um, and others that were of unknown significance that shifted to uh, likely benign, um, some that shifted two categories in either direction, and all of those were, were felt to be uh, things that were worth notifying clinicians of fairly rapidly. Uh, and then there are a number of others, um, uh, kinds of changes less frequent. Uh, these were sort of the main ones, and you can see it involved the variants of unknown significance, which very often are classified that way because it's the first time they've been seen, and there's no information on, on them, uh, or hardly any. And so as evidence accrues, then they shift in classification. And then there are also, you know, sort of low alerts that uh, shift from a likely to a benign category and, and vice versa. Uh, but again, an, an important uh, finding uh, and, and one that's also important to allow laboratories to, to do some planning, uh, it was estimated about 4% per year of uh, tests done in this particular laboratory uh, required a change in, um, in notification on, on pathogenicity, so, so that's important for planning. Um, and uh, another effort, uh, again, within CSER was looking at uh, how different labs um, uh, classified a given variant, r recognizing that even with fairly specific criteria, people can interpret them differently. And so the, the question then was asked across these, I think it was across the first six uh, of the programs, how often did they take, they, they gave them out, out a, a list of, I believe it was about 99 variants. Uh, and asked them how you know how would you classify this, and then looked at how often they were the same. Uh, and you can see here I've forgotten what the uh, the, the two bars were. I think um, it had to do with the, the uh, a subset of variants being more clearly uh, defined. But at any rate, uh, in only 34 percent of cases did they uh, define them the same across all of the laboratories. Um, some of them, um, you can see that there were differences between a likely benign versus a benign classification or pathogenic, pathogenic versus likely pathogenic, which is not terribly concerning, but when you get into um, some thinking, you know, that uh, a, a variant of unknown significance which would not be used in, in clinical care, uh, shifting to likely benign or, or benign or, or vice versa that might be used in clinical care could be fairly important and affect medical management, as you see here. The, the important thing about this is not only that the, the degree of agreement was relatively low, but more importantly, when uh, a, a consensus process was used across these laboratories to assess how people were looking at um, evidence and weighing it, uh, they were able to increase the agreement dramatically. So it went up from 34% uh, to 71% with complete agreement, and many fewer uh, disagreements that would, would affect uh, clinical management. And you can see that the scales here are, are quite different. So, um, so again, one of the, the things that we're trying to do in, in promoting this field is to promote standards and, and to encourage um, uh, more uh, consensus and consistent use of those standards across clinical laboratories so that we don't have to worry about a patient going to one laboratory, getting one answer, and going somewhere else and getting another. Uh, so that's CSER. Um, CSER also provides a number of resources for uh, implementation. I would encourage you, if you're interested in, in doing this kind of work, to go to their website. Um, it's, I think if you just Google clinical sequencing exploratory research, it should come right up. Um, and it, it's, it really is, is fantastic, the kinds of, of and for all of the participant consent forms, for example, are there, uh, education materials, the protocols that, that were submitted to their, um, their IRBs. Et cetera, um, reporting templates, the descriptions of the, the various pipelines. It's really a treasure trove of information, so I encourage you to, to look at that if you're interested in this area. Uh, the Emerge Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network, I, I mentioned to you previously, these are the centers that are involved uh, in Emerge, and Emerge actually has a, a whole variety, it's probably our most um, multi component program. So you can see uh, there's a, an aspect of data privacy, pediatrics is included um, as well, uh, pharmacogenomics, uh, clinician and patient education, um, clinical decision support, so, so kind of all of these things are, are rolled into one in this particular program. Uh, one sort of nifty finding that, uh, that I wanted to share with you was a, a very nice uh, the trial that was done at, uh, out of the Mayo Clinic site where they took 203 middle-aged adults at intermediate risk, sorry, and randomized them to, to estimate basically the coronary disease risk based on a genetic risk score or on a clinical risk score alone um, and see the, uh, uh, if that had any impact on um, uh, LDL cholesterol lowering in, in these patients. 
um, and also to, to check whether any of those differences were due to differences in diet activity or, or medication use. Uh, this was published recently, and what's, uh, I think, quite striking here is that people who received only the clinical um, risk score uh, had some degree of cholesterol lowering, but if they received their genetic risk score, they had quite a bit uh, more so. And that was almost exclusively in the people who had a high genetic risk. So if you were told you had a, a, a low genetic risk, you still lowered your cholesterol, but not nearly as much as you did with a, uh, if you were told you had a high genetic risk. So it was it really it's really felt by those authors and by us uh, that disclosing disclosing these oh, sorry uh, disclosing these estimates um, led to lower LDL cholesterol levels than uh, than disclosure of risk based only on on conventional risk factors, suggesting that genetic information is somehow more activating to to patients. We we know that in many cases. People are more sensitive to it. They're more concerned about it. We've always felt that that was a little bit unfair and, and why um, people get so concerned about um, uh, genetic variants where they don't get terribly worried about the implications of a creatinine level or a, or a complete blood count. Um, but this study suggests that maybe we can use that to our advantage if, if it convinces patients that they really need to do something about their uh, uh, elevated risk. Um, so it, the, the third phase of eMERGE is, is now, as I mentioned, looking at, at sequencing in clinical care systems, particularly uh, sequencing of genes with um, uh, some degree of clinical relevance, and then using the extensive electronic medical record systems to assess the phenotypic implications of those variants, sorry, uh, of those variants. And then with appropriate consent, report those variants back to patients, their families, if that's appropriate, and to their clinicians, and assess the impact of of that reporting on patients, clinicians, institutions, uh, and uh, the hospitals, that is, um, and uh, patient outcomes. And I'm seeing an email. Um, OK. So I'm, there are a few questions that are coming through. I'm, I'm thinking we may wait to, uh, to address those, uh, Dr. Mega. Is that, is that acceptable to you? There it is, Bruce. Yeah. I have a list of the questions. and. After okay. you're done, we'll go through those. Okay. Okay, great. No, I saw an email, and I was terribly worried that you might have lost me, so I, I wanted to read that. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Uh, moving on, the, the Implementing Genomics and Clinical Practice, or IGNITE Network, um, is, as, I, as I described, expanding and linking existing efforts and developing new collaborative projects, contributing to the evidence base um, uh, regarding using geno genomic information in clinical care, and then the sort of defining and sharing these processes. Um, IGNITE is a series of, of what we consider to be sort of hub and spoke projects. So the Duke project, for example, um, is taking efforts uh, begun at Duke and then spreading them uh, to other centers across the country. Um, the uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine is, is focused within uh, the, the area of New York City, uh, but different kinds of clinical care settings. And you can see uh, several other networks that, uh, that are also uh, collaborating in, in IGNITE. Um, and then we are. Uh, and one kind of interesting example is, is using ApoL1 testing. Uh, ApoL1, as I, I, think I mentioned, um, is a, a strong risk factor for uh, end-stage kidney failure um, in, in African Americans with uh, uh, high blood pressure. And so what they do is do this testing and feed that information back to the clinician and to the patient, um, and then uh, assess uh, how, how much better or worse or not uh, are unchanged the management of that patient is. So how often are they at gold blood pressure? Uh, how often is their, is their screening uh, accomplished as, as uh, recommended, et cetera? Uh, this was begun in, in Mount Sinai. You can see here on Park Avenue in, in Manhattan, in New York City, um, and is being translated out to uh, community health centers in, in the Bronx and in really very, very uh, resource-challenged uh, neighborhoods uh, throughout New York City. In addition, IGNITE has a, a series of, um, uh, there's a toolbox very similar to what's been done in, in the CSER program, sorry, uh, in the CSER program, uh, which provides uh, clinical decision support alerts, for example, and there are several of them listed there, uh, other clinical examples to support implementation. And the website is, is displayed there. You can Google Spark Toolbox. And again, if you're interested in implementing any of these kinds of, of um, programs, uh, you, you have tools that will help you to do that. Available there. 
Uh, the Clinical Genome Resource, or ClinGen, um, I described brief, briefly looking at uh, uh, developing a consensus process for um, uh, assessing and using uh, genomic variation. Um, it's the idea is to create a centralized resource of these annotated genes and variants, standardize the assessment of them, um, deposit them into a, a database resource called ClinVar, uh, which is uh, supported by our National Library of Medicine and works in, in close collaboration with the ClinGen project. Uh, also developing a consensus process for identifying what's clinically relevant, uh, curating these genes and variants, uh, developing, we would hope, some machine learning algorithms so that some of, some of this could be done in an automated way rather than having to uh, manually curate the, uh, the literature, uh, and then disseminating and exploring the integration of this with electronic health records. Um, and this is the, the ClinVar database. Again, uh, if you Google this, it, it will come right up. ClinVar is a very useful thing, particularly for laboratories that are trying to interpret new variants. When they sequence um, people and come up with variants that might not have been seen before, they look for them in various databases. This is one database that really should be consulted. Um, and here's a, a paper describing it in, in the database uh, uh, issue of nucleic acids research. Um, and if you, if you uh, go into uh, this program, you can view um, variation in much like in, in, in the genome browser. You can enter a particular gene. I think here it was the BRC, um, uh, sorry, I can't remember what, which gene they entered, but at any rate, uh, you can enter your favorite gene or something that's of, of interest to you um, and pull up the information that's known on that. Uh, in, in this example, for instance, uh, there were two laboratories that reported um, a, a given variant that uh, one was querying. Uh, both of those laboratories felt that the, that variant was likely pathogenic. And then they provide all of the information that they use to make that determination, uh, which is a, a tremendous help for those who are, are facing this information or, or facing a variant, you know, sort of the, the first time they see it, uh, because why should, should other people have to go back through the literature and try to dig it up. If it's once that's been done, if we can capture that information, uh, it's a, a service to everybody. And so this has been um, well uh, adopted by by really thousands of laboratories um, around the world, and, and would encourage everyone to you know, provide their uh, information if they can. I just show here a sort of a, a blow up of the screen showing um, what what information was used, and here you can click on this and see, you know, what criteria they used and what papers uh, they referred to in order to make those, those determinations. Um, there's also a, a process for sort of grading the quality or the quantity of the evidence. Um, and so something like, like this, where, where there are two sources uh, that provided criteria would, would give you sort of a multi-source consistency, so that would get two, sort of two gold stars. Um, if there's only a single submitter, but they provided criteria, they get one star. Uh, if it was a, a single submitter and didn't provide any criteria, there, there aren't any stars given. Um, and then there are higher, higher levels, such as having an expert panel or even a practice guideline. So in, in this particular instance, there would be a two star for multi-source consistency, and there's a, another link on the same page uh, for this variant that then shows that information. Um, so, and then finally, uh, just mentioning the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative, sort of how we got uh, on, onto this webinar as well as into, into this area. Our, our sixth meeting, as I mentioned, uh, involved the, the inviting uh, global leaders from as many places as we knew of um, around the world to, to really try to address uh, what what kinds of models are going on and, and what could be shared and used in other places. Uh, this is a, a view of our, our, uh, our web page that shows you where these meetings are, are kind of stored. So you can, uh, I should also mention, uh, we do keep a list of what we consider to be sort of notable accomplishments in genomic medicine. Um, our group surveys the, the literature uh, and, and every month we kind of review three or four papers that we sort of ask ourselves, is this something that's a, a significant advance that um, uh, people who are working in this field should be aware of? Uh, and we use it, you know, obviously when we're, we're trying to justify funding or uh, a new program or whatever, we get asked, well, so what, you know, what has been accomplished in this field? If these are the kinds of things we can point to. So that might be of, of use to you. Uh, but as I also mentioned, all of the genomic medicine meetings, uh, except the first, had a, a, a webcast uh, that's stored, and you can look at their slides. And one of those meetings was, was this, uh, the sixth meeting, and all of that information, the executive summary, the full meeting minutes, and the, and the videos and slides are all available uh, from that meeting. And out of that grew the G2MC, 
um, which uh, is, is co-hosted uh, initially by the National Academy of Medicine and, and NHGRI, and now is moving into being its, its sort of its own um, uh, entity itself. Uh, to kind of serve as a center and knowledge base for uh, genomic medicine activities globally, uh, particularly implementation activities, and then develop opportunities for uh, global genomic medicine projects that sort of demonstrate the value of this uh, of this approach and capture and disseminate best practices. Um, so, uh, and um, we also were able to. To, uh, to publish a, a description of what we have learned from that meeting, um, and uh, uh, that's available through uh, Science Translational Medicine. We had a second meeting of the group in Singapore in November, um, and you may have heard in previous uh, sessions of these grand rounds there will be a third meeting uh, coming up this April in Athens uh, that we would encourage uh, people who are interested to uh, to attend. So I think I'll stop there. I would just mention my uh, many colleagues, both at the NHGRI and the first two columns, and then our uh, genomic medicine um, uh, advisors uh, on, the, on the right side, as well as uh, people who participate in our meetings as being uh, enormously helpful in, in moving this forward. So I'll, I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Sure, thank you very much. And um, there are, in fact, a few questions uh, that have been communicated through email. Um, the first um, asks whether um, you have collaboration with other countries and whether there's um, sharing of information internationally um, in the area of genomics? Uh, yes, there is. Um, unfortunately, they're, they're not quite as, as robust as, or, or as, as um, uh, strong and, and um, frequent. As, you know, I'm, not, I'm having a loss for words, as you can tell. Um, but we have a, a few, the, the United Kingdom in particular, their Genomics England program has a very strong education component. Um, and, and so we're, we're working with them to, to try to share some of those educational materials. Also with the um, uh, Australian group um, is, is also developing an, an education uh, component and with the G2MC um, that through uh, Dr. Disignaki and, and Dr. Korf um, trying to develop you know, uh, a common ed educational materials. When it comes to an, an actual implementation program, we've had less of that. Each, each of the, the groups seems to be doing, you know, somewhat similar things, particularly in undiagnosed diseases. That, so there is a, a large collaboration, the Undiagnosed Diseases International uh, Network, uh, that just met uh, just recently in, in Tokyo, um, and and that is an effort to really share protocols and approaches uh, and data and all of those things, try to identify similar cases. So that's another, that's actually a, a, a fairly strong uh, effort. Pharmacogenomics, um, we're, we're working toward that. We do share uh, approaches to uh, pharmacogenomic implementation, particularly with the Dutch Pharmacogenomics Working Group. Um, and uh, there's a, a maybe aware of a large clinical trial that the European Union is undertaking, and we're looking at whether we can uh, affect a, a you know, have a, a, a parallel trial or, or some kind of a companion trial with that. Um, but we're, we really would like to have m many more such collaborations. And one of the reasons that we went looking at, at uh, international efforts was to see if there were things we could learn from other countries where there might be unique opportunities, either because of specific illnesses or allele frequencies, uh, or because of the structure of the medical care system. You know, opportunities to, to really adopt something that was going on there in, in other countries. Uh, one example that you may have heard of in, in other sets of these rounds uh, has to do with pharmacogenomic testing going on in Thailand, where they uh, really a, a very um, uh, interesting program where they give a little card to, to patients and tell them, you know, these are these are drugs that you shouldn't be taking because of uh, variants that put you at higher risk. Uh, and that seemed to be a, a you know really sort of practical approach that uh, could be adopted elsewhere. And so we're looking at at that kind of uh, adoption, too. Um, so there are a couple of questions that I think really just um, get to um, helping to explain the NIH to an international audience about um, whether it um, covers the entire U.S. and um, the source of the funding in the NIH. And uh, for international listeners who may not be familiar, maybe a few words about the NIH itself would be helpful. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so the, the National Institutes of Health actually uh, began about uh, over 100 years ago um, and, and has uh, grown into the, the 27 uh, institutes that I, that I mentioned. Uh, we receive a budget from our Congress 
um, most every year. Um, some, some years, uh, like this one, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the budget because of, of the political process. And so uh, very often we'll, we will sort of continue on our budget from the funding of the previous year. But generally, uh, that, that, I mean, the current budget was, a, I believe, about $32 billion with a B. Uh, so it's a lot of money uh, that, that uh, comes to the NIH. And most of that, about 85 to 90 percent of it, actually does not stay at the NIH. It actually is, is um, uh, put out into the universities. And um, some of it goes to businesses. Um, some of it goes internationally, so it's not all U.S.-based. Um, uh, foreign investigators can apply um, to, uh, to uh, receive NIH funds. As you might imagine, the criteria are a little bit stricter for um, uh, things outside of the United States, uh, that they have to show that they, they are relevant to um, uh, uh, U.S. populations, which almost all research in humans would be. Um, but they also have to score very well and, and meet a few other criteria. Um, at any rate, we, we do fund a, a fair amount of work in, in other countries and a, a fair number of collaborations, a lot of training programs and, and that sort of thing. Um, does that, you think that answers that, Bruce? Anything yeah, that, else that's great. Saying? Just one last question um, concerns whether there are resources um, for students in, in developing countries um, to help them in terms of um, becoming more familiar with research opportunities in genomics? Um, sure. I, I think in, in large part, part we see our, our genomic medicine meetings as being one way of, of making maybe not the research op funding opportunities so much as, as the research questions and gaps that are, are out there. Uh, particularly in, in genomics, and so that's, it's been a large effort on our part to be sure that that information gets out there. Uh, in terms of funding opportunities, we do make announcements. Um, there's something called the NIH Guide to Grants and Contracts uh, that's, that's now uh, available online, and, and actually um, at NHGRI we have a, uh, an electronic sort of social network effort where uh, if people are interested in receiving uh, information about our funding opportunities, we sort of push that information out periodically uh, to, to individuals. And so what, what we'll typically do is uh, what we think is of as a, a rigorous process where we describe what it is that um, um, we feel needs to be done. Investigators describe how they would do that, and then there's a separate review of, of the scientific merit of that approach, and then another review that sort of says, okay, um, if this is a meritorious approach, um, uh, how can we, you know, make it fit into an overall program? So it's a it's a process that takes a fairly long time, eight to eight to ten months is the shortest it can possibly be, and typically it takes a year. Um, but uh, uh, those funding opportunities are available, and if you be interested in um, um, learning about this or getting on that list, sir. Uh, if you, I, I think, Dr. Mega, could I ask you to, to maybe collect those and, and then uh, uh, we could um, uh, try and get get people on that. Yes, sure. That list, sure. Okay. Okay. Great. So if you could just e email him and, and let him know, uh, and then we'll we'll collect that and put you on that list. Well, Terry, thank you very much. I know the hour is late uh, where you are, and. Um, this um, webinar will be um, ultimately posted on the website, so available for um, streaming as well. Thank you um, very much, and uh, thanks to all for listening. And uh, with that, I'll say good night. Okay. Thank you. Good night.